hate you, sorry. Yeah. Uh, hello? Good? Right, now's the time to meet and greet. Meet someone you've never met before, or meet your best friend, or meet your brother, meet your mother, whatever. Why not? Um, so meet and greet, see and say hello to anyone, and yeah. Church. Never lose its power for me. I pray it'll never lose its power for you. Please be seated, church. Well, I was away last weekend. You know that. Uh, I was away for several days. Lara and I stayed up in Fremantle and uh, actually did a wedding while I was in Fremantle. It took me probably 20 minutes. It was Lara's nephew. I was supposed to get married 12 months ago, but it was a runaway bride situation. And uh, she came back and we married them in the park right across from the hotel we were staying in. It was a two-minute walk just in the park. We had cake and coffee and uh, it was all good. Sent them on their way happily married. Isn't that cool? And then on Sunday, uh, so good because I get here really early on a Sunday, which means I get out of bed really, really early while you were still sleeping trying to avoid the thunder. And by the way, Lara did not hear the thunder. She said, well, like we had no thunder last night. See, there are some benefits to being, you know, hearing in challenge, isn't there? And I said, it thundered, Lara. You have a good night, she said, fantastic. So there you go. Talk to Lara and get what she's got. Anyway, we, we were able to sleep in last Sunday morning, go and have a cook breakfast and just trudge around, take our time. So we went to church twice last Sunday, two churches I'd been wanting to go to, and one I was actually invited to go to, to get a guest speaker. One I went to in the morning was Nations Church in Myrie. And when our church grows up, I want it to be just like Nations Church. I really do. I love that church. Except their facility. You are so blessed. You are so spoiled people. You don't know how rottenly spoiled you are. To get a parking... They're in a, they're in a big old factory in Myrie, in a warehouse. And parking is all over the place, wherever you can get a spot. And you might have to walk half an hour to get there after you got your spot. And then when you park some spot, you might find someone come along and say, that's not allowed to park there and give you a ticket, right? You don't have that problem here. You just rock in, you've got, will we park on the lawn today because it's raining? Probably not, because I get my feet wet. <laughs> yeah, aren't you lucky? So that was, that was Nation's Church, great church in a great warehouse, and I, I, I was really blessed, and Lara was too to go there, and they have good coffee too afterwards. That, that's just a bonus right there. And then we're invited to go to Centrepoint Church in Bibber Lake Sunday night. Uh, they had a visiting speaker, and that was uh, Pastor Phil Pringle. Uh, although uh, Centrepoint is not part of the C3 movement, Phil Pringle is the author of the C3 movement. He started that, and uh, wow, he's a fireball when he preaches. You're not going to go to sleep when that man preaches. He, he does all sorts of things. He runs, he shouts. He threw himself on the floor. I thought he knocked himself out when he hit his head on the floor. I said, what was that, Lara? She said, I don't know. I don't know what he's got in his head, but that was loud. And uh, that was a great show. But again, they're in a warehouse. Warehouse is good. We started in a warehouse. But again, the parking. The parking, you've got to park miles away. And then try and find your car after the event in the dark. You know, you are so blessed. You are spoiled, rotten. And I was thinking about what Catherine said about BEMF, uh, Building Extension Mutual Fund. And on the 10th of April, we had a big prayer meeting here. How many went to the prayer meeting? Because we had a good number at the prayer meeting on Tuesday the 10th. It was really special, and we prayed into things like money. We talked mostly about money, and you prayed so well about money. So when Catherine uh, said this morning uh, about facilities, families, and finances, and you went quiet on the finance one, at that prayer meeting, you didn't. You prayed up a storm and we, we worshipped here and uh, we, we prayed about the BMF thing because we've swapped our loan that we have on the admin building, uh, which was with Westpac, to a Church of Christ bank. We've gone from worldly finance uh, to, to kingdom finance. And uh, when uh, Jeffrey McGuinness, uh, who's on our board, and I signed that document Wednesday before last, uh, I went on holidays immediately after that. I w was so 
so the, the deal's been done. I don't think I don't think the money's landed where it should have yet, but the deal's been done. We've signed the documentation. And uh, you were so excited at the prayer meeting, you ought to be doubly excited now that the deal is done. I want to hear your excitement this morning. <laughs> hey, we're about to start term two. Lucky, lucky. Well, you've got another week. But uh, uh, we, we Connect Group Studies, you saw it on your screens there, about soul keeping. Uh, you will need to get the... Uh, either the DVD or the uh, USB thumb drive eventually and come and see me and I'll tell you where you can get that and uh, and you need to buy the books and you need to buy your own books. We're not getting them in for you, are not going to spoon feed you. You, you. you know where Kurong is and you know where Amazon is and you know where iBooks are and so you, you, you can do that yourself. So that will be fantastic, yeah? yeah? All good to go. What we're going to talk about this morning is change. Change. And one of the things in life that causes distress in many people is change. Uh, if someone goes and changes, moves the goalposts, just when you had it all wired. Uh, you thought, I know what's going on in the church service. Pastor Gordon gets up and he gives a greeting and he does a care card sometimes. And if it's not him, it'll be, it'll be Catherine and Pastor Lee does the offering talk. Well, stuffed you up this morning, didn't we? Uh, this thing took place. And uh, there'll be lots of changes. The title of this series is called Dealing with Change. Uh, because change causes distress in many people, this series of messages is designed to help you deal with change in a positive way to navigate through all the things. And the title of this message this morning in this series called Dealing with Change, the title of this message is, message is Change Will Happen. You can count on it. Change is inevitable. The nature of life guarantees change. Luke chapter 2 verse 40, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. This was Jesus, but this is true of every human being. Uh, if everything is working okay in the baby, in the child, the child will grow and develop and change. And, and, and we all change. We all change. You have changed quite a bit since the time when your mother first saw you. Right? You married people, you have changed quite a bit, ladies, since your husband first saw you. Uh, men, you have changed quite a bit since your wife first saw you. And your children have changed quite a bit since you f first saw each of them. Yeah? Oh, look at the lads. When she first saw you, your mother tells me lots about you. And she first saw you, and look at you now, you big lumps, you big boys, <laughs> big lads. Yeah. And those of you who I have known for several years, you have certainly changed a bit. And I don't want you even to get started thinking about how much I might have changed since you first knew me. So I'm going to cut that right off of the past and show you. Here we go, some pictures coming up. That's Gordon. That's little Gordon. That's my big sister. Oh, that's Gordon going to high school. What a handsome dude there, moving along. Oh, who's he with? He's with his bride. Isn't she gorgeous, yeah? And uh, that's him when he went to Hong Kong uh, in, in another life. And that's him when he graduated at Murdoch University with a bachelor's degree. Someone saw that, the guy on the, on the computer, he said, you had a moustache once? I go, yeah, me and Saddam Hussein. And, <laughs> and that's me graduating... Uh, with my master's degree at Sydney University a few years ago, and you know what I look like today, so they would cut that off. Don't need to talk about that again, unless you want to talk to me later about the moustache, the caterpillar on the lip, all right. The nature of life, that's good, isn't it? I got to throw that hat up in the air, you know that one, with all the students? Big old Ian Jagelman, Dr. Ian Jagelman, he a big man, and he's a C3 man, by the way, and he, he took me down, he hugged me and took me down. Well, I'm ahead again. The nature of life guarantees change. Change is coming your way, ready or not. Change is coming. The nature of life guarantees change, and the nature of change dictates that change is a process, not an event. If you want a quote to take home with you today, take that one home with you. Change is a process, not an event. Here is a saying that you will have used, many of you, or at least you will have heard it said, Someone gets busted for infidelity or for speeding or for cheating and we say that wasn't a blowout, that was a slow leak. 
meaning that the calamity was not simply the person or the persons getting caught or whatever it was that they did. They had been doing this thing for some time or their lives and their standards had been compromised a long time ago and this was the inevitable outcome. On the blowout, it was a slow leak. So change is like that. If it is, and you get lots of these, if it is a governmentally legislated change, or even if it is a church leadership-led change, the new signs of the event may have been put out today and the new program implemented today, but there was a process that led up to this point of new signs and new programs. It began some time ago. It's a process, not just an event. The nature of life guarantees change, and the nature of change dictates that change is a process, not an event. Following Jesus' birth, his parents did all the all that was necessary to comply with the uh, Judaistic Mosaic law. On the eighth day, Jesus was circumcised. On the 40th day, Mary and Joseph attended the temple in Jerusalem for the purification rites that every woman that had a baby needed to have. They attended the temple. And at this time, Jesus was presented and consecrated on the 40th day since his birth. And it was in the light of these events that Luke comments, the scripture I read earlier on, that the child grew and became strong at the 40th day. He had changed. Since the time of his birth, he was constantly changing. Twelve years later, parents, twelve years later, Luke 2, 42 to 43, when he was twelve years old, they, the parents, Mary and Joseph, Jesus, went up to the festival up at Jerusalem, according to the custom. It's fascinating, parents. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus, 12 years of age, stayed behind in Jerusalem, but the parents were unaware of it. Just go through your memory banks, parents. Did you ever do that? It's time for confession right now, so I'm going to confess. We did it. (laughs) We we lived at Greenmount early in our marriage, apart from living overseas for five years. And my in-laws lived at Scarborough. My wife was a Scarborough girl. They were away somewhere overseas or interstate, and they wanted us to go down to water some pot plants, but we were going to Bunbury. So we drove down from the hills, down to Scarborough, watered all the pot plants. Our kids all got out of the car. Remember, we got like... Not sure if we had four or five at the time, but this would have been the third one that I'm talking about. We did all the things we needed to do, locked the door, jumped in the car, and got halfway to Fremantle when we did a head count. If we were supposed to have four, we had three. If we were supposed to have five, we had four. The third one was missing. <laughs> you turn back to Scarborough. There she was happily playing in the sandpit. Not sure what we said to her. Whether we're cranky with her, whether we're cranky with our souls, or we're just glad that no one had kidnapped her and all was well, shook the sand out of her clothes and went on our way to Bunbury. With Jesus, you've got to understand, when he was 12 days old, this would never have happened. Even when he was 40 days old, when they first went up to the temple with him, this would never have happened. But at 12 years of age, parents... It was a different situation because he had changed. He's no longer a little baby that is dependent so much on his parents. Change is a process, not just an event. There are changes that you choose, and there are changes that you need to deal with and respond to that you did not choose. Just growing up presents you with a myriad of changes. You saw that handsome little boy there that grew up and graduated a master's event, right? Who would have thought? Just living and navigating life presents you with a myriad of changes that simply come your way. You didn't ask for them. Sometimes your parents put them on you because they moved. And as I look out at many of you, uh, your parents moved from somewhere overseas to here. Did you have a say in that? Did you take a vote? I don't think so. They go, we're, we're moving. 
Some of you moved into state, and uh, your kids went with you. Uh, did the did you take a vote on that? No, no, you simply made up your mind, and so someone had to live with the their response to the choices that you made. Just living and navigating life presents you with a myriad of changes that simply come your way without any decision or choice on your behalf until you deal with the change. 1 Timothy 1, 3. Uh, hey. Paul is saying that of, of, of uh, Timothy, in fact. Probably not the verse I really wanted. What, what Timothy did, Timothy started the church at Ephesus and one day Timothy needs to, sorry, Paul started the church at Ephesus, and one day he needs to go to Macedonia and Greece, to Philippi, to Thessalonica, and to Athens. And he'd never gone back to pastor that church. He'd been pastoring it, started pastoring it. And so he puts Timothy in charge of the pastor, and he says to the church, I'm leaving, I'm going to Greece, I'm going to Philippi, to Thessalonica, and to Athens, and Timothy's your man. And so he wrote to Timothy many times, uh, remembering Timothy in his prayers and saying, uh, uh, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth. He was just a lad. And, and, and Paul was concerned that uh, the people of the church may actually try to put one over on Timothy because he's not yet a seasoned veteran in leadership. And I'm telling you, when... The young fella takes over from the older fella. That's a change you have to deal with. And the church at Ephesus had to deal with that change. When those kind of changes are put upon you and you didn't get a decision on them at all, that can rock your boat. You do have choices and decisions to make about those. You just never chose the change in the first place. But now you, your choices and decisions relate to how you will respond to these changes, how you will deal with with these changes. There are changes that simply come your way with no decision on your part about that change. And then there are changes that you choose. Changes that you are the architect of. And I'm pleased to say that I am the architect of many changes in this church. I choose to make changes. I, I get that choice. And the way the church works is that every change, every potential change I come up with has to go through a number of filters. Has to go through a staff filter, has to go through a board filter, and even a tougher filter has to go through a Lara filter And before you get there. So many of potential changes that I love to orchestrate, you, you've never got to see them. Praise God, you say? You have no idea. In most cases, I love to orchestrate change more than I like to have change put upon me by other people, which I have to deal with and manage. Are we all the same there? You make changes in your house. You make change in your home. How will you deal with change? How will you manage change? John Maxwell, uh, the great Christian pastoral leader who shares with businesses and churches, shares with us what he calls evolutionary process of change rather than or versus revolutionary change. Uh, most of us can handle evolutionary process better, better than we can revolution. Evolutionary process is just a little tweak on the way you were doing things. Just a little tweak. So instead of Gordon giving the, the, the greeting, it's going to be Gabby. That, that's just a little tweak. Uh, see, and a revolutionary one, we're never doing greetings again. You go, I don't like that change. I like the Gabby change. I don't like the no greetings change at all. I don't want that. We're able to handle refinement better than we can handle a total departure. Are you with me here? Nevertheless, in any church or business or sporting club or sporting organization, even with refinement change, evolutionary rather than revolutionary, there will be a number of different responses to those changes. Now, I've got a little chart coming up on your wall here right now and you've got your response or response of people around you, 2% of people in our churches and in our businesses, in our sporting clubs, uh, they are innovators. They love new changes and new ideas, and they're going to they're be always on about them. They want them. 10% of people in our churches, our businesses, our clubs, are early adopters. They, 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 they're pretty keen on change too and new ideas. They quickly embrace them, and actually they'll even promote them. So, so far we're up to 12%, right? 
60% are middle adopters. They aren't going to move at all anywhere. Uh, they ne don't necessarily want any change. They're happy never to change. What's wrong with the way we've been doing things? Man, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? I say if it ain't broke, well, let's break it so we can change it. All right. 60% of middle adopters, although they essentially didn't necessarily want any change, it doesn't take them too long to be positively influenced by the 12% innovators and early adopters. So I'm going out after the innovators and early adopters because they're going to help me get the change done. Are you with me here? 20% are late adopters. Oh, late adopters. Late adopters. These people will often speak out against the change and against the person who wants to make the change. And they will drag their feet before reluctantly following the majority and getting on board with the change. Oh, late adopters. Some of you are late adopters. I love you, late adopters, but I'm going to work with you in a different way than I'm going to work with the innovators and early adopters. Are you with me here? Yeah. Now, another, another category to go, you can see the 8%. Laggards. Would you say the word with me? Laggards. Yeah, you put a bit of body English into that, didn't you? Laggards. Laggards are always against change. Their commitment is to the status quo and to the past. They don't want to change anything. And they will often attempt to create division in the organization. Every organization that's had a division thing going on, a church split, an organizational split, it'll be, laggards will be in there. Laggards will be in there. Uh, they're always against change. Their commitment is to the status quo. They will attempt to create division in the organization to keep things just the way they've always been. I wonder where you are on that scale. I wonder. Some common reactions uh, to change uh, as presented by social scientists Scott and Jaffe. Uh, and I think there may be a, a thing coming up on your screen yeah, Scott and Jaffe, change model. <laughs> Denial. I don't believe they've made that change. I don't believe they're serious. They're not going to do that change at all. They're just not going to do it. They wouldn't be. I don't want change. I don't believe they're doing the change. I don't want to. I'm going to live like they've never done the change. They're not doing the change. Resistance. I will fight the change. Encounter and I'm going to fight. I think they're a laggard. I'm going to fight that change. Over time, though, when the 2%, the 10%, the 60%, and even the 20% late adopters get on board, they go, you know, seems like everyone else is going for it. I might just explore it. See what in it for me. See how I can accommodate to this. And then fourthly, commitment, I, I think I'll get on board. I think I'll get on board. No one else is splitting over this. If I get enough to split with me, I'm not doing it. I'm going to cut them away and I'm going to, I'm going to make them pay for even thinking about the change. But the majority won't do that. They go, you know, I think I'll get on board. I want to spend the remaining part of this message in talking about how to develop resilience in managing change. Because not only are you going to be continually confronted with change, the rate of change will not slow down. The rate of change will speed up exponentially. The rate of change will get faster and faster and faster. So you need to deal with change, handle change, not be messed up by change, because a lot of people get messed up by change. They've gone and done another change and they're messing with me. I don't want you to be messed up by change. I'm going to put change on you, but even if I don't, somebody else will. You can count on it. I don't know how many of you are genuine believers. I never know that in the house at all, uh, having totally surrendered your life to Christ. Because uh, I, I never know that. I remember... Uh, last year or the year before it might have been, I baptized someone here and then I was in a small group with that person uh, maybe six months later and we were talking about being born again, right? Uh, being, becoming a new person in Christ and they go, I don't know what you're talking about. And they go, whoa, and I baptized you. I should have held you under for a bit longer. I obviously didn't get it. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, it's too, uh, so I, I just know it's too easy to simply come to church reasonably regularly and go on the volunteer roster and all that kind of stuff and uh, without totally com committing to Jesus and his message and what he offers you and just play the game because everyone else is playing the game. You're kind of like a laggard by, with that issue and you just say, eh, that's what everyone else is doing, I think I'll do it. But, but you, you, it's between you and Jesus, not between 
you and the others in Jesus. And so at 2 Corinthians 5.17, we're talking about dealing with change. Jesus is your primary point of reference in dealing with change. Believers, genuine believers. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The, the old is gone, the new has come. In Christ, this is a spiritual metamorphosis. And you know what metamorphosis means. That, that's, that's the caterpillar to the butterfly. Uh, that's the tadpole to the frog. But a spiritual metamorphosis, uh, that's from being not born again, being a worldly person, uh, to being born again. Uh, that, that, that's that's a, a spiritual metamorphosis. From unsaved to being totally born again, a new creation. Uh, before commitment to Christ, you were time bound. After commitment to Christ, you are bound for eternity. Uh, before Christ, you were earth bound. After commitment to Christ, you are bound for heaven. Before you were limited to the physical, now you have a spiritual perspective on everything. Before it was all your own ideas, you leaned on your own ideas, now you're going to lean on Jesus' ideas. Before your hope was locked into yourself and your family uh, and your friends and your house and your job, now your hope is in Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Change is spinning around us. It's confronting us. It's challenging us. And every change gives birth to yet more change and faster and faster change. Some we accommodate and some not so much, right? I'm going to talk more about that next week because the government puts changes on us. What are we going to do with them? And where I sit... Man, I, I, I get documentation from the government telling me how I've got to respond to the next change they bring in. And, and I don't want to respond in the way they want me to respond. And I refuse to respond in the way they want me to respond. How are you going to deal with that, guys? I've got a small story to tell you about that. Nick. But we see Jesus. Uh, Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ch he is changeless. Change is coming all around us, faster and faster, but Jesus Christ is changeless. It's just the world around us continuing to change and change the thrust upon us. Jesus Christ and his gospel never change, but the way in which we communicate the gospel had better change if we're going to address the changing world. hope you're hearing me. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is, comes from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. He doesn't change. There will be change all around us. Many of those changes we will need to embrace, while some we will need to reject, and we need to work out what to embrace, how to embrace those changes, and what changes to reject. You need to think about this. We need an anchor. We need an anchor. And the anchor is the unchanging Jesus. Lamentations 3, 19 to 24. I remember my affliction, writes Jeremiah the prophet, and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I will remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. And yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. When you feel overwhelmed by change and the rate of change and the nature of change, please remember this. Please call this to mind and therefore have your hope renewed. The unchanging Jesus and because of his great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Father in heaven, Change is swirling all around us all of the time. All of us are confronted with change and uh, the very nature of life brings change. And the very nature of change dictates that it is not simply an event but a process. It's going on. And yet changeless Jesus Christ, Jesus the same yesterday, today and forever, we look to you, great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Uh, for changes that are confronting anyone in this house this morning, they're finding difficult to deal with. This morning, Holy Spirit, 
touch our hearts and lead us closer to Jesus, the unchanging Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Take us forward in that wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, people. I just wanted this morning, you know, it's so critical that we have a spiritual metamorphosis, otherwise change is going to mess with you. It really is. And the spiritual metamorphosis, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old is gone, the new has come. And he doesn't change. Uh, this morning, I just want to make sure, and I want you to make sure, that you've actually surrendered your life to him. And if you haven't, there'll never be a better time in your life than today to make that change. And in order to know that you've made that change, you can do that right where you stand or sit in the congregation. I'm going to invite you to stand down here this morning and make it new with our Lord Jesus Christ. As we sing our song, if that's you and you're just feeling that he's pressing you forward, would you come on down the front this morning as we sing our song? Let's give it heart and soul and voice this morning in Jesus' name. Singing. He will never fail you. Never fail you. Doesn't matter what changes come, how fast they come, what kind of changes are, he will never fail you. He'll never let you down. He's on your side. Uh, he has chosen you. You're one of his people. He will never let you down. He's unchanging. Change comes. He's your anchor. Father God, I pray for every person in the house this morning. All of us, Father. All of us, Jesus, we want to move closer to you. Whatever we do, we, we want you to be our discerner. We want you to unpack the things that come our way that we might do them your way. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Father, I think of uh, some of the things we've shared here today, just the BMF thing, and as a church moving to kingdom finance, away from worldly finance, uh, trying to lead your people, Father, to a place where we are no longer slaves to the lender. Help us to become all that you would want for us, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Father, I want to pray for Chris who's walked out this morning and you know the story that she carries within herself. You can read her heart, Father. And this morning as you read her heart, Holy Spirit, I'm praying that you would touch her heart in a way that would be so powerful to her, that move her to the place where you would want her to be. Pour out your grace and your blessing, Father, on everyone, but right now particularly in a, in a large portion for Chris this morning. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, as we uh, wrap up here this morning and eventually we'll go home through this stormy day, take us home safely, Father, uh, that we might continue to give you the honor and the glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey, people, it is it is that kind of day, right? It's a soup kind of day. Should have brought a pot of soup today, Lara. That's what we should have done. But we've got coffee and hot chocolate and raisin toast and probably not so many chairs and tables out the back on the old fresco unless you brought your own big umbrella. Uh, so we might move some tables and chairs inside to accommodate you inside because you want to hang around and have a coffee and raisin toast with the people that you know and encourage them. I just want to encourage you to come back tonight. Take a risk tonight. The storm will mostly be over by 6 o'clock tonight. Right? So come on back because I've got something to share with you tonight a series called Values, right? And uh, values, great values. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock. Love you to be here. Bring a friend with you in Jesus' name.